Lives of the Unconscious. A podcast on psychoanalysis and psychotherapy. Episode 12. The Architecture of Personality. Structural Disorders. When psychoanalysts contemplate their patients' problems, they do not only have their symptoms in mind. What is also decisive is the larger psychological context in which a symptom arises. For according to the psychoanalytic conception, a symptom, say the feeling of fear or of depressive dismay, is only an indication of some underlying psychological problem. The nature of these problems can be quite different for each patient, depending upon how their psychological house, one also speaks of psychic structure, has been built. The very same symptom in two different patients can mean something completely different. An anxiety symptom may perhaps indicate that a certain part of thought or experience is felt to be threatening and should be avoided, but it can also be evidence for a much more profound process, such as the feeling of inner disillusion and fragmentation, or of an impending fundamental loss of self, as is characteristic of delusional moods in the run-up to a psychotic episode. In the psychoanalytic view, every symptom can be assessed in terms of where it is located within the psychological house. What this means, we will hear about in this episode. In psychoanalysis, the mental processes that lead to the formation of symptoms and mental disorders are roughly divided into three areas. Firstly, the so-called neurotic conflict pathologies. Secondly, the structural disorders. And thirdly, traumas. We can illustrate the difference in the following image. Let us imagine a house in which people are living communally. We have already heard in various episodes of our podcast that there are multiple residents with quite different interests living in our psychological house, which, just like in a shared flat, can easily lead to conflicts. For example, there is one roommate who attaches great importance to order and cleanliness, while there is another roommate who has an alarming inclination to surrender themselves to their immediate needs, to laze around and have parties as they so please. We don't need much fantasy to imagine that these two roommates will quickly come into conflict. If the communal life of the flat has attained a certain degree of maturity, it will be possible to come up with a compromise. Say, in that all the flatmates sit down and develop a plan as to when cleaning and work must be done and when parties can take place. Translated into our mental life, this would be the case when an inner conflict can be settled without the formation of a disorder or a symptom, like when we find a good compromise between the need for pleasure and the necessity to work. Now, a neurotic solution to the conflict would be as follows. One of the roommates gets their way, from now on, a rigid cleaning regime dominates, and the order-loving roommate sentences the entire house to daily cleaning frenzies. But the conflict has not really been resolved. Subliminally, it continues to smolder. The other flatmates are more or less openly discontent, which drives the lover of orderliness to impose their regime all the more harshly. The whole flat begins to exhibit symptoms be it through compulsive cleaning or through a general disgruntled mood, constant friction, and overall dissatisfaction. One can imagine, however, that an outsider, a flat therapist, so to speak, could be helpful here in finding somewhat more mature solutions to conflicts, mediating between the individual flatmates and basically creating a little more leeway for example, in helping to create a realistic cleaning schedule to which everyone adheres, while at the same time also allowing time for relaxation and parties. 
In the case of a structural disorder, it is less the conflict between their roommates that is central than the structure, the architecture of the house in which they live, so to speak. Here, too, cleaning may be carried out compulsively, but not only because of an adverse resolution to the conflict, but rather because damage to the roof of the house lets the rain in. The residents of the house get wet feet, and the cellar is already underwater. If they don't clean, mop, and bale the water with all their might, the whole community is in danger of drowning. Here, too, conflicts can arise between the roommates, but not only because they have different interests, but because there are no doors in the house, or the walls between the rooms have holes. Here, it is difficult, or nearly impossible, to find sustainable compromise solutions. The flat is rather more in a permanent struggle for survival, which becomes all the more acute the more storm clouds gather above the house. Something that the inhabitants of another house with a tight roof can hardly comprehend, for the very same thunderstorm does not bother them one bit. Here, one also sees that a flat therapist, with suggestions for how to live together better, is very limited in what they can accomplish. For a start, it is a matter of working on the foundation of the house, that is to say, its fundamental structure. Only once the cracks in the roof and the walls have been closed, would the flatmates be provided with the space to spend their days doing anything but obsessively cleaning and mopping. In addition to neuroses and structural disorders, there is still a third level that psychoanalysts take into consideration. That is trauma. The term comes from Greek and means wound. This image hits the nail on the head, for a traumatic incident inflicts a wound in a particular place that cannot so easily be repaired, nor does it simply heal over time. Trauma can affect anyone, regardless of whether someone has problems on an erotic level or on a structural level. To remain with the metaphor of the house, the flatmates get along with one another, given the circumstances. Everything in the house actually works quite well, except for this one room where the walls are cracked, which may have suffered damage through a lightning strike and where the rain comes in. Although they have decided to lock the door to this particular room, if for any reason the door were to fly open, the whole flat would descend into panic. If there are many such holes, or if the house was struck at an early stage of construction, problems similar to those of a structural disorder would arise. But what in the realm of the psychological are the walls, the roof, the house, the psychic structure? The house metaphor helps us to describe something that is ultimately invisible. The question of the substance of psychological structures has been highly controversial from time immemorial, and many disciplines have claimed to have discovered it, most recently certain representatives of the neurosciences. But here, too, it is not so easy to translate what we experience and learn in the realm of the psychological into chemical formulas and neural networks. We do not know what the psychic structure actually is. Yet we can indirectly infer that there must be something like psychic structure. We can discern this merely by the fact that we need not reinvent ourselves each day, but rather can draw on a kind of inner foundation that continuously tells us who and how we are. That there is something like fixed psychic structures we can also discern from how difficult it is to change, or rather, we can take note of the meaning of psychic structures precisely via their absence. The founder of psychoanalysis, Sigmund Freud, also dealt with this question of what holds our psychic world together in its innermost core, and developed his own reflections on it. This is the point where his infamous structural model comes into play, which divides the psyche into three instances, the id, the ego, and the superego, each of which acquires different functions. Today this model is no longer encountered in its classical, i.e., former application, 
but makes up one of the foundations upon which today's understanding of the psyche is based. By the way, a model is always only an aid to help contemplate reality, never reality itself, which is perhaps why attempts to find Freud's three instances concretely in the structure of the neurons are based on an epistemological misunderstanding. To put it briefly, Freud considered the three instances mentioned as representative of different domains and desires within us, which may be in utter opposition, i.e. conflict with one another. Somewhat simplistically, one could say, the id is the pleasure-driven side of us that wishes to unwind on the couch with a cold beer, preferably for the whole day. The superego, on the other hand, is the strict side in us, that reminds us day and night to work so we can get ahead in our careers. The ego now has the tiresome task of mediating between these two opposing instances. Say, for example, first, a few hours of concentrated studying, then, with a clear conscience, off to the couch. It is believed in psychoanalysis, and this is important for today's understanding, that someone develops psychological difficulties when they can no longer adequately mediate between different conflicts, or, that is to say, when they can no longer be solved. As when, like in the example from a moment ago, a person does nothing but drive themselves to study with a whip, hardly takes time off, and is no longer capable of enjoyment, although they have worked a 12-hour day, or conversely only indulges their desires all day while completely neglecting all other obligations. Freud's model is also important today because it describes two fundamental aspects of the psyche. First, humans are creatures of conflict who must constantly find solutions and compromises for inner and outer demands. And secondly, implicit to his conjecture, is that humans have different abilities for dealing with these conflicts. The degree of the psychic structure determines how good someone is at solving these inner conflicts. Clamor can thunder through a stable house without the walls collapsing, whereas in an unstable house, even a slight draft is enough to make the structure rickety. While recourse is indeed still made to Freud's structural model in contemporary psychoanalysis, the conception of structure has long since been further developed and broadened. For example, there are even distinct psychodynamic diagnostic systems, such as the so-called Psychodynamic Diagnostic Manual, or the Operationalized Psychodynamic Diagnosis. Otto Kahnbeg's model of personality organization, which we will hear about in episode 13 on Borderline, has also been influential. Psychodynamic diagnostics often thus place special attention on the so-called structural dimension. According to this model, psychic structure refers to the manner in which psychic processes of a person are organized. When it comes to psychic organization, attention is paid to various features. The architecture of the house, as well as how communal life is organized, as it were. There are two basic classifications namely, how relationships to others are experienced and shaped, and how a person relates to their own psychological experience, to the self. The psychic structure thus describes how elastic and flexible the organization of the self, as well as the relations to the outside world, are. In one direction, self-organization can be extraordinarily stiff and rigid, the structure is, as it were, too tightly woven. Too rigid could mean, for example, that a person always perceives themselves and others in the same way, or must compulsively maintain complete control over themselves or others so as not to devolve into utter panic. For behind a rigid organization of the self are usually massive fears. Even the smallest breach of this inner organization principle triggers a catastrophe. There is little leeway for flexibility in dealing with mistakes, failures, 
and inner contradictions, even if they arise only in the form of a ludicrous thought. A person with a too rigid psychic structure has few possibilities for new and thus transformative experience. That means those that further development. It is as if the film of inner experience has been cast over every new relationship. At the same time, because of this rigidity, they always find themselves in massive conflicts. While on the other hand, a too loose psychic structure could mean that someone experiences themselves or others completely differently from one moment to the next, cannot establish any real coherence in their experiences. As an example, their partner, who at one moment is idealized, is in the next completely devalued. A typical feature of a psychic structure that is too loose is often found in how time or temporal rhythms are managed. Oftentimes, these people hardly manage to keep appointments, pursue activities with regularity, or maintain a coherent daily structure. Here, one can once more illustrate the difference between a conflict neurosis and a structural disorder. For example, with a conflict neurosis, someone would systematically miss appointments because they have an unconscious aversion to the appointment, but inwardly cannot find a more mature solution to express their unwillingness. Forgetting the appointment would be a neurotic solution to the conflict. A person with a too loose structural organization also has the tendency to forget appointments. But this is not primarily because they do not consider it important or necessary, or because they are expressing an unconscious aversion, but rather because they lack any inner temporal structure to which they can fall back on reliably. Like water in a bowl full of holes, the appointment trickles out. In our example, that means it slips the mind. The person must effectively reinvent themselves each day, and in the long run, this can become quite demanding, leading to many oversights and corresponding problems. Both forms of organization, a too rigid and a too loose psychic structure, indicate structural disorders and are often only two sides of the same coin, possibly appearing in one and the same person parallel. A well-functioning psychic structure forms something like an organic framework that limits and holds, while also allowing for permeability and air to breathe, which is why one of the central metaphors for the psychic structure is also the skin. The therapeutic approach to structural disorders differs from neurotic conflicts, although there is, of course, no sharp distinction here. Whereas in the case of conflicts, it is often a matter of revealing the unconscious part, say aggression or aversion, and of establishing an awareness of one's own emotional life, so as to create more room for conflicts. With the therapy of structural disorders, on the other hand, it is about fundamental work on the architecture of the psyche. Anyone who has ever tried to relocate the load-bearing walls of a house knows what a delicate and difficult task this is. In order to bring about change here, the therapy, that is the therapist, must often take over this supporting function for a time. They must become a piece of the patient's psychic structure, which, over the course of a successful therapy, the patient can once again adopt and internalize as their own. This podcast is written and produced by Cecile Lutz and Jakob Müller. Translated and read by Solomon Lawrence.